O Lord, you have taught us that without love, whatever we do is worth nothing. May I preach to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We've spent the past few weeks working on one of the most well-worn parts of our Holy Scripture, and that is Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. As you listen to this gospel, these pieces are Sunday school snippets. They are so familiar to most of us. They're embedded in our memories. And for me, it can be hard to even pay attention. Yeah, yeah, I already know this. I skim it. And not only are they rote, but they're hard. They're unrealistic. They're these heavy theological rocks that Jesus is handing us wrapped in this pretty flowery tissue paper. But they're heavy, they're hard. Hold your enemies in love. Pray for those who hate you, who wish you harm. Love those who do evil. This sermon, like so many that we hear from Jesus, goes against the most fundamental fibers of our humanity. It requires the impossible. And so this morning's gospel becomes a litany of things that Jesus somehow expects us to be able to do. Be perfect, he says. And not just any old perfect. Be perfect like God is perfect. Take a moment and check in with yourself after hearing that. Be perfect like God is perfect. What does it feel like to be given these difficult, if not impossible, instructions? To be told to seek perfection? Did any of you really need to hear that from anyone else? That's the kind of thing we tell ourselves all the time. It's the kind of thing we hear repeated in a million different ways in our culture, in our lives. Be perfect. I'd venture a guess that every single person sitting here this morning has had some sort of brush with perfectionism. We live in a culture, especially here in Westport and Fairfield County, that values perfection. You can't even get to church on Sunday morning without driving past the soul cycle, the Tiffany's or my most coveted Williams Sonoma. (laughs) So for us, perfection is something that's attainable. It's in front of us. If we work hard, we put in the hours, it's within our grasp. The perfect body, the perfect outfit, the perfect kitchen. And so we hold ourselves to these incredibly high standards. And this can be such a beautiful thing. It can yield incredible results, as we see, look around you. There's so much to be gained from our desire for perfection, for ourselves, for our community, for our world. And this community here at Christ and Holy Trinity is bursting at the seams with people living full, beautiful, productive lives. We are a group of creators, organizers. We work hard. We're raising brilliant and insightful children. But today's gospel offers us an opportunity to understand perfection in a totally different way. Perfection takes on new meaning when we frame it in a spiritual context. The word in Greek that Matthew uses in this gospel text for the word perfect is telos. Telos. 
And telos in Greek is not about some sort of moral or physical perfection. It has nothing to do with your grades or your performance reviews or your abs. Perfection as telos is about reaching an intended goal. It is the pinnacle of one's existence. The telos of an arrow is the bullseye of a red and white striped target. The telos of a lumpy, hard, brown, amaryllis bulb is a tall, elegant, blood-red bloom. And the telos of a Christian is love. So telos, or perfection, refers to the process of becoming the most fulfilled version of ourselves. Perfection is a movement. It's a posture. It's a way of being in the world. Perfection is about being oriented towards God's will. It's using your gifts to move closer into God. And we show up here on Sunday mornings to seek out new ways to participate in that process of fulfillment, the process of becoming the people that God created us to be, becoming the community that God intends for us to be together. And Jesus gives us these magnificent instructions on perfection. Don't hit back. Give freely of your gifts. Be generous with your heart, your time, your resources. Be moved by love. And the problem here is that being moved by love doesn't always look good. Perfection in God doesn't look like the kind of perfection that we expect. It's rarely shiny and beautiful. It doesn't have nice abs. Most often it's messy or just downright ugly. And think about it. For us as Christians, the pinnacle of perfection in God, the most profound love that we experience is embodied in the cruel and unjust execution of our Lord. It is our brother crucified. This is not the kind of perfection that we're used to. Now I know the places where I've felt closest to this kind of perfection has been in the messiness of mission. Somehow for me, I feel myself move in close to my telos through my awkward and bumbling attempts at being Christ's hands and feet out in the world. Yes, it has its moments of intense beauty, but it's complicated. I do it badly a lot of the time. But mission work, service to one another, love of neighbor is messy. Last summer, 16 of us loaded into shiny minivans and drove down to the Ninth Ward, one of the poorest neighborhoods in New Orleans. And this is a place that has never recovered from Hurricane Katrina. There are only a few houses and lots of abandoned, overgrown lots. There are almost no trees, which is stifling in the middle of a Louisiana summer. And the few remaining residents, mostly poor, mostly African American, are miles away from a grocery store, from a pharmacy, from a school. And they live in the shadow of this huge cement levee that is holding up the mighty Mississippi, the same levee that broke, a levee that is still cracked and precariously patched up. So we had arranged to spend the day working at a local nonprofit in this neighborhood. 
was called Our School at Blair Grocery. It was an urban farm and an educational center for the youth of the neighborhood. In the midst of this no man's land, it was this urban oasis where youth could go and learn about farming and planting and eating right and healthy food. It was incredible. And so Kate Nelson, our youth director here, she and I spent months getting this trip planned, working on this specific project. We just wanted to get every single detail perfect. So I had these visions of us planting kale with neighborhood kids. We'd be carrying fresh buckets of Louisiana strawberries out into the neighborhoods, feeding people, making friends. We were going to plant things and get our hands dirty and build greenhouses and recycle and sing and hold hands. It was going to be perfect. And that morning, we pulled up in our air-conditioned vans to what appeared to be an abandoned schoolhouse. I checked my GPS like three times, making sure we were in the right place. And there we stood and sat there in front of this old, crumbling house wrapped up in creeper vines. And my stomach twisted into knots as I saw a skinny, dirty, scraggly-looking man in a ripped t-shirt, a cigarette hanging out of his mouth at seven in the morning, saunter up to the other van. So I got my mission leader, mama bear, posture out, and I got out of the minivan, ready to confront this guy. Mm -mm. And surprise, this was the man that I had been emailing for months. This was the CEO of the nonprofit. And as I sort of adjusted to this new information, these three young men, boys, also dirty, half asleep, wearing ripped tank tops and work boots, stumbled down the stairs of the broken down house. It was the COO and the CFO. So this is your mission trip leader's big uh-oh moment. I was really nervous. But we stuck with it for the day. You never know how things are going to go. We'd made our arrangements. We were already there. Let's jump in, see how things go. So we spent the day with these men. We weeded their okra plants. We herded their raggedy flock of goats around the block. There were no children to play with. But we dug mulch, and we listened. And through the course of the day, these three men, these boys, shared with us their experience. These were young, troubled men, one who was a teacher who dropped out of his PhD program and found themselves living in the boonies in New Orleans, trying to create something beautiful together. And they had been through every kind of hardship you could imagine. They were competing with other nonprofits. They'd been shut down by local authorities. They had been trying so hard to raise money unsuccessfully. They were fighting with the notoriously corrupt Louisiana government. It was a mess. No wonder they were so scraggly. But their intense love and passion for the work they were doing in this neighborhood was like nothing I have ever seen. Yes, they were smelly, they were sunburned, and they cussed and chain-smoked in front of my kids. It was not ideal. But we came to realize that these were people living into their perfection in God. This small plot of land was the telos, the telos of these young men. And their dedication filled me with such admiration and such love. I wanted to drop everything and join up with them. I think the best paraphrase of what Jesus commands us to do this morning comes from St. Catherine of Siena. She says, 
Be who God created you to be, and you will set the world on fire. We are constantly being called into the messiness of loving one another. We do this as a congregation, we do this in our families, we do this in our own hearts, and we know how complicated, how messy, how gross that kind of love can be. But perfection is the journey. It is a becoming. So move into your telos. Be moved by your deep love and set the world on fire. Amen.